to do uh, tonight to get with you is to, to credibly question uh, the nature of truth. Is to ask ourselves, what does it mean when we say that something is true or false? And in thinking about this over the years, uh, I've come to the more or less obvious conclusion that to understand truth, we need to understand how we think. And it turns out we have a great tool for that, computers. They are great mirrors, because computer designers, which I have been one, uh, project onto the architecture of computers the patterns of our clearest thinking, our clearest thoughts. So that's where we are going to start. Uh, bear with me, we will cover a lot of ground quickly. If you have had experience with one of these, a handheld calculator, you know what a computer does, operations with numbers. The difference is that you can't go in there and type in these numbers one at a time to take you forever to do anything meaningful. So designers add a little filing cabinet with all the relevant numbers and they connect it to the calculator inside the computer. So the calculator can go in there, open a couple of drawers, take a couple of numbers out, perform an operation, and store the result back in another drawer. And it does it over and over again. That's what a computer in essence does when it's, uh, when it's executing a program. Now, the name of the game is to do it faster and faster so computers get, quote, smarter. And 10 years ago, here in this campus, what we've done was to replicate this cluster of filing cabinet and calculators, spread it everywhere, and have them talk to one another, mostly locally, to do things faster. This is a real architecture. You can find it today. Some high-end TVs have been bought by Intel uh, earlier this year, so who knows where it's going to end up. But the thing I want to bring up to you tonight is this. This looks like the way the brain operates. If you look at what uh, uh, Daniel Gannett calls maximally planned computationalism, this is actually a very good model for how the brain operates. And we can take this even further and look at an individual brain cell, and it becomes more or less clear that the filing cabinet is analogous to the dendrites that carry the input potentials into the neuron for further process processing. And the calculator is analogous to the neuron body that produces, calculates the output of the neuron. <laughs> but there is one very fundamental way in which a neuron is unlike this calculator. Because if you look inside this calculator, you will only find simple logical operations with zeros and ones, true or false, on or off. Over time, it looks like this, an oscillation between only two allowed states, which we call bivalence. So the world, from the point of view of a computer, is very fundamentalist. It's Black or white. It's either true or false. Nothing between, not both, not neither. A neuron is not so fundamentalist. It sees shades of gray. It has more degrees of freedom. And you might ask, well, you've just contradicted yourself, uh, Bernardo. You said that computers reflect the patterns of our thinking. And that is true, because although our neurons are not bivalent, the way we use them globally is different. Our logic is different. When we ask, uh, well, tough questions about reality, like, are alien abductions for you? We expect that this question will have an answer of the form yes or no, true or false, even if we do not know what the correct answer is. That's how our logic operates. And the reason we think like this is that most of us make the assumption of realism, which is a good assumption. We assume that there is an objective world out there, independent of our minds. And it is the hard objective facts of that world that ground our knowledge of reality. So if there are <coughs> literal spaceships coming down and beaming people up against their will, then yes, alien abductions are real. True, one. In all other cases, false, unreal, zero. Very different. This link between the objective facts of the world and how we think of reality is what uh, logicians and philosophers call uh, the correspondence theory of truth. And it is the only reason for our different thinking. It is the only justification for us to think differently in terms of either true or false. The problem is that it is not well supported by physics. Um, since at least 1981, there has been an experiment performed over and over again with consistent results that throws realism into doubt. And it goes like this. There's a light source in the middle that creates a photon to one side and a photon to the other side. A photon is a particle of light, if you will. And on either side, there is a detector that can measure certain properties of the respective incoming photon. 
And as it turns out, and this is experimentally confirmed, that it, it's not polemic, there's no doubt about that. The choice of what to measure, I'm sorry, the choice of what to measure on one side instantly influences what is actually measured on the other side. I may need time to grok this. What I choose to measure here changes what is measured on the other side. Even if the detectors are separated by miles, as it has been done in Switzerland in the late 90s, and even if I only choose what to measure after the photons are already in flight. Well, that's pretty weird stuff, it's spooky. So scientists came up with two hypotheses for this. Hypothesis number one, grab with me. The photons are magically connected beyond space-time limitations. So when the first one gets measured, it tips off the other instantly. <laughs> Hypothesis, if you laugh about the first one, there, prepare yourself. <laughs> Hypothesis number two. The photons don't really exist until we look at them. In other words, realism is false. Reality is not out there. Reality is, in a way, in here. Our cognition of it brings it into existence. And for almost 25 years, well, over 25 years, there had been no reason to choose between one of, one of these two hypotheses as, as, as the best one. Until 2007, when a group of Austrian physicists realized that there was one particular correlation between the measurements that if it were to be observed, it couldn't be explained by the photons being connected. So you have only one possibility left, which is, which is realism is false. The photons are not there until we look at them. It has been published on Nature, uh, number 446, here's the reference. Very little repercussion. But the, 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 the result is that this correlation was observed, so it's looking pretty precarious for realism today uh, in physics. If it turns out that we must abandon realism, we lose the correspondence theory of truth. We lose the grounding of our knowledge on those stubborn, hard, objective facts of reality. There is no such a thing. And we lose any reason to think in terms of either true or false. There are a few people who discuss these implications, but these are necessary implications uh, of these experiments. And then you might ask, well, Bernardo, does anything go then? Do I define what's true and what is false since there are no hard facts out there? The world doesn't seem to operate like this, right? We all seem to share the same stable reality. There's a lot of foolishness out there, as Judy has just uh, explained to us earlier on today. Uh, so what's going on? How do we put these things together and make sense of it? We can get help from mathematics, from an unsung hero of mine, a uh, Dutch logician, Lachlan Brouwer. Uh, at around the turn of the 20th century, uh, most mathematicians thought of mathematics as, as existing in completeness, full, ready, in some abstract but objective realm of the mind. Well, I, I hesitate to say realm of the mind, in some abstract realm, objectively. So mathematicians, in that sense, would discover mathematics. And what Robert said was, no, 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 this is nonsense. Mathematicians create, they construct mathematics. But the very moment he said that, he lost the correspondence theory of truth. How do you say whether a mathematical statement is true or false? If you create it yourself, you're creating those truths. His great insight was that you still have an objective criterion for determining what, what is true and what is false. And that is consistency with the choices you've made. I'll give you an example of that, but the idea is Every time you make a choice about what is true or false, that choice entangles you very quickly in an unfathomable network of implications and reduces your degrees of freedom from making new choices very, very quickly. Let me give you a quick example that you all can understand. We've learned this in school. If I'm in debt and I double the debt, I end up with twice the debt. No problem, right? I dug a hole, I dig that hole even deeper, and I'm in a deeper hole. No problem. But what about this? I am in debt, I multiply that debt by an even bigger debt, and lo and behold, I get out of debt. <laughs> so if any one of you has a mortgage bigger than mine, come talk to me in the <laughs> <laughs> And yet this must be true. This has to be true if we are to remain consistent with our methods. And I adapted a little derivation here from Professor Ian Stewart, a wonderful derivation. It goes like this, look, I can do this operation, it's very simple. Two times minus one plus minus two times minus one. Minus one is the common term, 
So I take it out. I end up with 2 minus 2 times minus 1, which is 0 times minus 1. 0 times anything is 0. No problem there. I can do the same thing again in a different order. No tricks here. There's no magic. 2 times minus 1 like before. But now I know the result should be minus 2. So I put minus 2 in there. And I know the whole thing should end up in 0, as I have just derived. What is the only number that added to minus 2 will give me 0? So if you multiply that by another that, you must get out of that. If only the banks would allow this operation to, to be done. You see, because we make choices about what is true in arithmetics, very quickly we run out of degrees of freedom. Very quickly we get entangled in this network of implications. And mathematics starts looking very objective, although it's mentally created. So what is the reality of tables? And by the way, I'm just following the physics here. What if the reality of tables and chairs is like this? What if it looks objective because it's just the unfolding of all the implications of some primordial choices we've made? And what if these primordial choices are now so internalized within us that it's hardwired? It's part of our collective unconscious as a species, if you will. Then reality would look objective as it does. It would look uh, autonomous, independent of our will, because it's all the unfolding of this network of implications. And if that is the case, nature is fundamentally absurd, because to think differently is our choice. We've chosen to think like computers, and that's how we, that's why we design computers the way we do, following our logic. Truth may be grounded on habit. They may depend on what has been true, and may be encoded in our psyches unconsciously. There, there, there are people who have talked about this over the decades. I'm not the, certainly not the first one to suggest it, so I refer you to Alfred North Whitehead, Robert Sheldrake, and a number of others. And, and that sort of takes the glow out of rationality a little bit, because rationality then is a self-imposed restriction of the degrees of freedom that are actually available in nature. I'm not trying to debunk rationality here, just put it in perspective. That, that, that's my only goal. And then you might say, well, how do we visualize this? I mean, this is crazy stuff, right? How can we make sense of this? How do we paint a mental picture of this? And that's where we get help from Dutch artists and C. Escher. If you've been paying attention there on the side, we have been displaying Escher drawings throughout my presentation. He shows us how a non bivalent reaction, uh, reality, may look like. Here's a detail of one of his drawings, the same drawing that is in there right now. If you look at it, the picture invites you at first into a very bivalent interpretation. Water is going down, not up. It is true that water is going down. It is false that water is going up. But if you follow the water, things start looking weird very quickly. These columns here, I'm not sure about that. Oh, oh these columns are really long here. Well, yeah, I'm still, I'm still buying this story that the water is going down, and then it backfires on you. Big time. It is impossible. The water is not going down or up. Maybe it's going down and up. Or neither down nor up. <laughs> Whatever it is, it is not different. Yet it's pretty real as an experience. It's right here in front of you. There is no trick. If reality is like this, then you might ask, why doesn't, doesn't it eventually blow back? <coughs> backfires on us like this, this picture clearly backfires on us. I don't know, but maybe we have such an innate need for closure to find a final explanation for everything and make sense of our pain and suffering. I don't know, that we push this completely beyond our ordinary experience to the point that we may need equipment of this size to look deep into the heart of matter, into subatomic particles. And there we find this strange loop, like uh, Douglas of Stasser used to say. There we find the absurdity, the non benevolence of matter. And then if you think that every atom in your body, every atom in everything around you right now is in that sense non benevolent and that reality around you right now is fundamentally absurd, even though we've all pushed it beyond our ordinary experience. That is uh, some food for thought. Now, the fact that things may be absurd, and I use absurd here as a synonym for non-bivalent. I, I, I don't use that in a negative sense. 
If reality is absurd, it does not necessarily mean that it is meaningless. Carl Jung has left this to us as, as, as his legacy that uh, things that are absurd, this continuous, non-devolent, like a dream, like a vision, uh, they are meaningful to the extent, maybe even more meaningful than logical reality, because it is not bound and constrained by the rules of logic. It, it can leverage more degrees of freedom to evoke experiences in us. That is what I consider Jung. The absurd is profoundly meaningful. If you've read Jung, you will see this throughout his works. That is a common theme uh, in Jung. So the idea I want to leave you with to wrap up my talk is that we live in a pretty broad reality, right? Whether it's in the mind or out there, uh, it is broad. And it may be wishful thinking to imagine that uh, the boundaries of our logic, of our rationality, uh, are coextensive. They, they <coughs> sit on top. They are equal to the boundaries of reality. For all we know, we may have boxed ourselves in a subset of what is really possible, uh, a subset that is amenable to our logic. And beyond that subset, there may, there may be something that one might call a translogical reality, a domain to borrow from you, uh, a domain of meaningful absurdity, more akin to a dream than to the rational, <coughs> order, continuous the world we live in. And I wonder what one would see if we stuck our head out of this box. Who would we see there? Would we see ourselves having the dream we call history? I'll wrap up here. Thank you.